The Money Show with Bruce Woodfield on 702. Let's walk the talk on 92.7 and 106 FM. The Money Show proudly brought to you by ABSA Corporate and Investment Banking, the bank that brings you the 2021 ABSA Africa Financial Markets Index. That's Africanacity. ABSA is a registered FSP. Welcome to The Money Show on this Tuesday evening. Big story out of uh, Glasgow today, the COP26 uh, gathering. We've seen the hugest um, transactions so far. Uh, South Africa getting an $8.5 billion loan for the Just Energy Transition Partnership, they're calling it. It's a huge agreement between a coal-intensive developing country and uh, a group of uh, Western governments who have got deep pockets and are wanting to speed up our transition to a greener future. Um, as somebody, I think Richard Poplack at Daily Maverick uh, today said, this is Greta Montasha's worst day ever. Um, not only is the ANC getting a, a, a big smack in the polls, but also uh, he is the chairman of the ANC, but also as energy minister, um, he is quite wedded to the idea of coal. And I think South Africa is going to be a coal economy for a lot longer than it appears at this stage. But let's get a perspective this evening on that big announcement. We'll also talk about the elections in some detail this evening. We'll catch up with the chief executive at Net One. Um, Net One has made a huge investment in the South African economy. Andy Rice with the heroes and zeros and wrapping it all up with your investment time horizon. How long you should be considering investing uh, if you want to um, make money in stock markets in the foreseeable future. So that's all coming up tonight on The Money Show. The Money Show. With Bruce Whitfield on 702. 702. Remember about a year ago, maybe it was nine months ago or so, Chris Skitter from uh, Astral Foods uh, saying that uh, they took uh, the Lekwa municipality, that's the municipality around Standerton in Mpumalanga, uh, they took them to court and got a court order that forced National Treasury to intervene for better management of Lekwa. What's so interesting here is how the ANC has substantially lost um, its power in uh, that Mpumalanga seat. From 20 seats down to 13, um, the DA has gone from 5 to 4, but the Lekwa Community Forum has got itself 6 seats. The FF has won 3, but it is significant. For the first time, the ANC below 50% in an Mpumalanga municipality. Another big one uh, was the DA in KZN at Ngeni, uh, the Howick municipality you might know better as, and they've won that municipality, taking 13 seats up from 10 last time, swapping places with the ANC. Still looks like a messy coalition for Nelson Mandela Bay. It looks like a messy coalition for Tswane, too early to call perhaps in Gauteng at this stage. But for the first time ever, For the first time ever, News 24 projecting that the ANC will receive fewer than 50% of the national vote. And again, predictions on social media already beginning that Lutuli House is going to become a cesspit of greater contestation. So much fun to look forward to as a result of the ANC's worst ever election victory. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. 702. Two things that didn't happen until after you'd voted. A big fuel price increase announcement and, of course, the reinstatement today of load shedding. Petrol inflation at nearly 34% year on year. Quick view from Kevin Lings, the chief economist at Stan Lib this evening. This is enormous. I don't know if we've ever seen a year like it, Kevin Lings, where there's been such a big increase in fuel prices. Evening, Bruce. Yeah, it's quite a significant adjustment now. And as you say, it's been moving up now for quite some time. If you go back to, I think it was May last year, the petrol price, believe it or not, was 12 rand something. Uh, and now we're almost at 20 rand. So a massive increase, something like a 60% increase since then. And over the past year, up 33%. So, um, a huge uh, price effect that obviously we're now going to have to deal with more fully because we're trying to obviously open up the economy and you've got the prospect of a bit more domestic tourism, people moving down to the coast for holidays, etc. Whereas when it initially started to move up the petrol price, we were kind of in lockdown and uh, I guess we weren't traveling as much. So the initial part of this increase, I would say, didn't cause as big a effect, but it's going to be felt now. And then unfortunately, um, given where the currency is, 
Right now, there would be next month another increase at around 50 cents a litre if the petrol price, if the oil price stays where it is and the currency stays where it is. And and so that would take us to 20 rand a litre. So so at this stage, unless the currency strengthens or the oil price falls, we're going to have another fairly sizable increase. And that's obviously going to occur at exactly the wrong time. And it's not just the petrol price. I mean, you add electricity prices into it, and the cost of the energy basket for our daily lives is up exponentially. That's right. So electricity, the current uh, inflation rate for electricity is 14%. And if you think about your use of energy, it pretty much permeates every part of our economic life, right? So anything that you do in from a business perspective, household perspective, all of that involves some form of use of energy. And if you've got electricity at 14% inflation, fuel at 34%, uh, those increases are well in excess of any household income or business activity growth, anything like that. So it's, it, it's taking up a bigger and bigger portion of our overall um, economy and obviously it puts a huge amount of pressure not just on households but on on business in terms of how do they absorb those costs do they pass those on uh, and do we get start to get more broad-based inflation what does it mean for their competitiveness it has significant implications and and clearly the reserve bank when they meet uh, i think it's 18th of november um you're going to have a look at a at an interest rate increase because obviously this could uh, suggest broad-based inflation starting to build up. Kevin Lings, Chief Economist at Standlib, with that warning this evening. Yeah, our fuel price is high. I mean, it's uh, sitting at record highs from a South African perspective, and it's the equivalent of about $1.20, which puts us on a par uh, with Canada. Fuel prices in Canada are roughly the same. We're a little bit more expensive than Brazil, twice as expensive as Russia, uh, twice as expensive as Saudi Arabia, a bit cheaper than India, around the same as Australia. But uh, certainly the UK um, and the Central African Republic have much higher fuel prices than we do. The UK, you'll pay pound eighty seven. For a uh, for one dollar eighty seven, I beg your pardon, for a liter of fuel compared to South Africa, where you're paying one twenty at the moment. But a huge part of that increase over the last ten years or so has been as a result of taxes put into the fuel price mix, um, and that's one of the reasons why our fuel price is blowing out in the way that it is. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. 702. The first significant financing deal to emerge from the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow. A 130 billion rand financing package on favourable terms for South Africa to get a move from being one of the biggest users of coal for electricity to using a lot less. Let's get a view this evening from Melissa Faree. Now, Melissa is a director at the Centre for Environmental Rights. It doesn't feel like a huge amount of of money, uh, Melissa, in the 21st century, but it's a good place to start, I would guess. Yeah, good evening, Bruce. Look, you know, I think it's a it's a pretty big deal. Um, it's a big coup for South Africa. We're the first country to, to manage to conclude such a deal. Um, uh, you know, obviously COP26 was always supposed to be the finance COP, so there were great expectations, and I think there are so many great expectations from many countries. So it's a big achievement for, for our government. Um, it is a good start, but as you say, it is you know given the sort of scope of the of the cost of the transition, you know we really need finance that is transformational. So that that 8.5 billion dollars, 131 billion rand, it's a it's a big amount, but you know we know that you know for things like worker transition and for Malanga alone, worker transition, things like infrastructure and the coal towns that need to be fixed, need to be fixed. Um, a coordinating body for the just transition, you know, supporting special economic zones for renewable energy, all of those things that will make up the just transition. You know, we, we're looking at at least a billion dollars, you know, it's, it's sort of a conservative estimate. And that's just from Pumalanga. Uh, who's going to call the shots as to how the money is spent? Who's going to manage the purse strings? South Africa has got an unfortunate reputation, an entirely justified reputation of being a, a country with particularly long fingers. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. And and so the devil obviously is in the detail. <laughs> And we have many questions as, as civil society and, and environmental justice groups looking at this. 
um, including who is going to, how is the money going to flow? Um, who's going to, who's going to control that? Um, how will we have transparency and accountability around that? And I'm sure the donor countries are asking very similar questions. So what the presidency announced today is that they're going to start this 12 month process with a, with a task force uh, made up of, of, you know, South African governments and representatives of other governments, presumably. Um, the donor countries and basically develop a, a kind of work plan for how this is actually going to work. So we don't really need, know that kind of information at the moment. Uh, the other thing, of course, that we don't really know is what is the nature of the concessionality. The, the statement calls it highly concessional. It's basically like a, a collection of different instruments, grants, concessional finance, etc. And we, obviously we want to know how much of it is concessional finance, how much of it is grants. You know, many of us believe that those countries that when we're doing this deal owe a large climate debt to the South and to South Africa in particular in this case um, that has that has to be repaid. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this how this plays out over the next twelve months. Yeah, because we've got the UK, we've got the US, France and Germany involved in this particular loan. Do we have the detail of the, some of the T's and C's? The money will flow in. I'm sure it'll come at massively preferential interest rates, incredibly low interest rates. Um, do, what are the sort of time frames in which these things need to be paid back? No, those are the sort of details we don't know at the okay. moment. The, the second talks about three to five years. Uh, is a period over which this will play out and as I said it starts with a six month sort of process to get to uh, and, you know to kind of start this process and then have it and within a calendar year it's supposed to have a what they call a full program of work for this partnership so that will look at the details the financing instruments you know there's also a question of like where does all this money come from it's also put together from a whole range of different kind of climate finance instruments so these are sort of all of some of the details that need to be sorted out but it does, you know, it does seem, even in the absence of the details, it sends a really powerful political signal, obviously, um, you know, that that uh, those countries recognize their obligation, you know, towards countries like South Africa. Um, and hopefully we will be one of the first of many. Um, and, of course, it sends a signal that, that people see South Africa as a, as, a, as a good recipient for this kind of finance. Um, and that we have shown the political world with our more ambitious NDCs. You know, we're not, as all society organizations, we're still not happy with it. Um, but at least it's a good start. So, um, you know, and mm. that, that we have the political world to meet those kinds of, uh, that kind of climate ambition. I think we can celebrate it. But at the same time, um, yes, this is the first deal to come out of COP26 in Glasgow. But does it make the slightest bit of difference unless we can get big um, energy users in Asia, China in particular, to make a similar transition? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, that, that is obviously harder to control. <laughs> And so, so we're obviously looking, um, you know, we're obviously hoping for more to come out of that. Uh, see, India just today announced a, um, a, its own net zero target by 2070, um, which is obviously, you know, not, not, a, not what people wanted, but it's probably um, the best that, that India could do at this point, feasibly within their political environment. But these are all good steps, you know. We obviously, we're on a long road here, and it's, it's it's really life or death matters, you know, that we're dealing with. Um, and for many, many people across the globe, this, is, this really is a life or death matter. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll have to see what happens in the next few days in Glasgow. Thank you, Melissa Faree, Executive Director at the Centre for Environmental Rights. We'll get a view on the story also from a former finance director of ESCOM, Paul O'Flaherty, nowadays a part of EY Parthenon, which is the EY strategy consulting arm. He'll join us in about 20 minutes to talk around the same issues. Looking at the Bloomberg Billionaires Index today, um, Elon Musk is now three times richer than Warren Buffett. Buffett, once the world's richest man, he's insisting on giving it all away, of course. Elon Musk is um, still in a building phase. He's still collecting. His net worth rose to $335 billion yesterday. That's more than 5 trillion rand. So he's a trillion rand richer than he was 10 days ago. And uh, we've seen Tesla share prices go up about 8.5% in New York yesterday. And that made him richer than Jeff Bezos, the next world, uh, richest person in the world. Uh, and, of course, Buffett is chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. He's number 10 in the world now with a net worth of $104 billion. So Elon Musk worth three times more than Warren Buffett. Elon Musk is also worth more 
than Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg combined. An astonishing set of statistics coming out of their Bloomberg Billionaires Index today. The Money Show. The Markets. Norman McKechnie, Portfolio Manager at Momentum Asset Management. I can almost visualize you shaking your head in disbelief and wondering to yourself, at what point does the Tesla house of cards come crashing down? Or am I misreading um, the signals I'm getting over the phone? Um, Bruce, yeah, look, I mean, I think it's obviously it's done particularly well. I mean, if you think about sort of how many cars they produce, I mean, uh, obviously... Well, when I say obviously, they produce a lot less than Toyota. I think it's probably uh, less than a quarter of what Toyota produces. Um, and, uh, you know, it has been a company where there's been a lot of debt. Uh, I think they are moving into profitability, but um, there's a lot of competition on the horizon with some very good motor vehicle manufacturers. I think they um, probably have got the, uh, the lead on, on others. Uh, but, yeah, I think the big question is what is growth going to be like in electric vehicles? There's an awful lot of infrastructure that we've got to put in place. Um, and, uh, you know, the other issue is which you talked about with this whole climate issue. A lot of the power that's generated, if you look at sort of global power, about 80 percent of power comes from coal, uh, gas and uh, uh, oil. So there's got to be a big change there. So it's all very well putting electric vehicles in when they're still charging up 80 uh, percent of the charge that's going into them comes from fossil fuels effectively. So, yeah, there's a, you know, it's it, it, it's a nice to think that way, but I think if you go upstream and you look at uh, what uh, they require in terms of energy, uh, we, we, you know, that's where we need to change. And I think um, uh, it, the, it, getting back to Tesla itself, I think um, there's a lot priced in. It looks, uh, I must say, it looks very, uh, very full at this point. Yeah, and what about the JSE? I mean, I, I just look at some of our commodity shares. Kumba is probably half of what it was in August when it peaked. Um, we've seen quite a yeah. sharp pullback in, in many of those commodity shares, and those were the, the shares that were carrying the JSE's very strong rally for most of this year. Yeah, it was. I think if you look at something like iron ore, iron ore is trading now below $100 a ton. I think in May it was trading at $225 a ton. Uh, so, you know, in terms of, we talked last time about the change in management there. I think, you know, it, we, we probably need to talk not so much about the jockey, but the horse. Uh, and the horse is certainly under pressure with the um, top line ca- uh, more than halving. Uh, that's, in other words, the revenue because of the lower iron ore price. And then the other factor, which you sort of alluded to in, when you chatted to Kevin, was the petrol price, well, the diesel price is the same. I think the diesel is up 148 and uh, the petrol price about 120 odd. Uh, and a lot of the input cost that goes into uh, actually removing the sort of uh, overburden and uh, getting into the ore is diesel related. So you've got a cost squeeze coming in here where uh, the revenue line is obviously going to be down going forward, assuming iron ore prices stay where they are. And then their costs have moved up fairly sharply. I think the uh, diesel price or the uh, uh, oil price is up probably close to 40% year to date. So, yeah, that's why the prices are taking strain. Uh, it obviously then feeds back to, you know, what's happening in China. China's been the uh, growth driver. Uh, their steel uh, production has been, uh, they have cut that back uh, for a number of reasons. And, and that's what we're seeing now in commodity markets. Uh, and then what about MassMart? It's a really strong looking trading update out of MassMart, which is under the direct management nowadays of, um, of the controlling shareholder of Walmart. Um, but a, a really strong performance. I think, yeah, I think recovery is on track. Sales were up to the 4.4.5%. Uh, they were obviously impacted by lockdowns and civil unrest. Uh, I think the big thing there coming through is sort of, one, the rationalization of businesses they sold off uh, Cambridge. Uh, liquor sales rebounded particularly strong, strongly. We've seen uh, building supplies up probably around about 12%. But for me, the big issue here is the cost savings. Uh, they're, they're pushing through about $1.9 billion Rand's worth of cost savings, and uh, I think that's, uh, you know, looking at both the revenue line, which is uh, improving, and the costs that are coming down, it's the reverse of what we saw in Kumba. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's always attractive to see that. I suppose the, the next question is, what does valuation look like? And that's probably reasonably sort of fully priced at this point uh, in terms of what we look at. Uh, and then just yeah, looking at global markets, they seem you know, 
quite resilient in the face of uh, the, the absolute terror of higher inflation. And um, when we look at what's happening to local fuel prices, I mean, globally, inflation is, is very much part and parcel of what investors are worrying about at the moment. Yet, strong performances happening across the globe still in terms of investors buying shares. No, absolutely. I think, Bruce, if you look back the last two quarters, if you look at the S&P 500, that's the, the big index in the, in the U.S. Uh, equity index, the share index. Um, the earnings that have come through, they're up 70% over the last six months. And it's, a lot of that's been just margin improvement that's come through as the, uh, we've unlocked. Um, we've also uh, seen consumer spending uh, pick up. Uh, and that's uh, driven up margins. So margins, uh, in other words, the profitability of U.S. companies is at all-time highs. And really it begs the question now, uh, you know, what sort of valuation do you want to place in that? Clearly valuations have come down, so they're looking cheaper than what they were. But they probably look slightly expensive uh, relative to what earnings are likely to do uh, in the next 12 months. And the number of forecasts coming through saying margins have peaked, earnings have probably peaked, and we probably will have some headwinds, in other words, lower earnings coming through. To answer your inflation side of things, I mean, U.S. inflation is highly correlated to the uh, oil price. And um, if one looks at you know what we've got now, a lot of what we're seeing in terms of oil price moving up has been a shortage of gas. Uh, and gas py- uh, powers a lot of uh, power stations in Europe. Uh, gas has been in short supply. They've turned to coal. They've turned to uh, oil to fire up those power stations as they go into winter to meet demand. Uh, and that's pushed the oil price. Uh, the Russians are now talking about pumping gas uh, in the next week or so through to Europe. And I imagine the, the gas prices will normalize and come back as will the oil price. So that probably brings U.S. inflation back uh, somewhat. Uh, which is uh, hopefully uh, will be will should be that'll be beneficial for SA uh, uh, as well. Thank you, Norman McKechnie, portfolio manager at Momentum Asset Managers. The Money Show is proudly brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking, the bank that brings you the 2021 APSA Africa Financial Markets Index. That's African Asity. APSA is a registered FSP. This is The Money Show. Welcome to it this evening, 19 minutes to 7 o'clock as the vote continues. It's a slow process. It's uh, 20 hours or so, 21 hours since the polls closed. Um, and uh, about half of the votes I have been counted so far. 48% of the votes so far have been counted. And there are some parties that are going to be devastated by their performance, some that will be delighted by their performance. I think Action SA is going to be um, pleased with what it has achieved, particularly in Gauteng. Um, The DA is going to be, I think, very, very concerned that it is not one Nelson Mandela Bay. It's nowhere close. And it looks like there, if the FF and the ANC can get it together, there could be a very powerful coalition there, maybe even in Itaquini as well. Um, So, yeah, some interesting uh, uh, alignments that are going to take hold. Um, the DA could be interesting if it gets into bed uh, with the Freedom Front Plus in uh, City of Tswane and Action SA. If those three could make um, bedfellows, that might be interesting in the City of Tswane. So um, certainly South African politics has been shaken up quite substantially, but a bigger shakeup, and, and frankly, from a planet perspective, a far more important shakeup is what is happening in Glasgow. Glasgow, of course, is at the epicenter of COP26 and a big deal out of uh, COP26 for South Africa, which was going to get what's been described as an initial $8.5 billion in concessional loans for up to five years to get rid of coal and to get a transition going to renewables. It's Germany, it's the United States, the United Kingdom and France, and they are willing to lend South Africa 130 billion rand to speed up the country's shift away from coal. We are the biggest users in the world of coal for our electricity. Now, Paul O'Flaherty is a former finance director of ESCOM. He is now a head of EY Parthenon, the EY strategy consulting arm. And I wonder, Paul O'Flaherty, what you make of this money for a just energy transition. Um, Give us your perspective on this, please, because you've been inside the belly of the beast. You know its dependence on coal. um, And uh, you'll see this from a completely different perspective to almost anyone else. Yeah, hi Bruce. Uh, good evening. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a great move. Uh, 
developed countries have promised $100 billion per annum for the developing countries. So this, this is just the start. So I think it's great news. I, I think, you know, Eskim has spoken about their just transition. Uh, and, and I think this, this, this is a good signal, Bruce. Uh, a good signal. Um, we we don't have the detail yet as to how the money will be apportioned. We don't know um, how the money is going to be expected to be spent and who's going to call the shots on that money. One does hope, Paul, and I'm sure you will vouch for this, that there is a very strong oversight of how that money is utilised. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, and, and as you said, the details haven't come through. When they say concessional, you know, what does that mean from an interest rate, et cetera? But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that those countries providing it will, will demand strong governance over the use of those funds. Talk to me about how this energy transition works. I mean, it's a, it's a long process. We don't simply yeah. flick off the carbon utilisation that the planet is so heavily dependent on and suddenly all rely on, on hot air and, and sunshine. Um, this is a, a long transition. Is it a transition that we are firmly into? Can we achieve it? It's, it's a very long transition. Um, you know, the, the world is, is committing to temperature increase by one and a half degrees Celsius by the mid of the century. Um, and, and if we don't take action now, obviously that's not going to be achieved and, and that's a disaster. So the COP is important for that, uh, Bruce, that the countries actually uh, submit their national determined contributions. They have detailed action plans of how they're going to get there. Um, I think we all read that IPC, the United Nations IPCC report earlier this year that, you know, this is real. Um, and, you know, South Africa is, is, is at the start. You know, we have to follow our integrated resource plan. We've made quite aggressive uh, uh, national de- determined contributions. So, so this money is welcome uh, and more. And, and I think all, all, all South African businesses need to get behind it. Are we capable of pulling it off? Do we have the skills? Do we have the know-how? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the million-dollar question, Bruce. Can we actually execute? You know, we, we too many times... Uh, have our great plans, and, and yet we seem to fail to execute. But I, but I don't think this time we have an option. Uh, we, we will have to get find those skills, whether they come from overseas, or we will have to train those skills up. Uh, new technology is a big part of this. Our renewables program is a big part of this. Um, so, yeah, we, we're going to have to commit. You know, we have to get business, government, and, and labor behind this, Bruce. Uh, and what are the odds of that occurring? I mean, there seems to be a, a, g- a good deal of common sense prevailing. We are, of course, in another bout, yet another bout, of, of load shedding. I think there's a huge amount of disgruntlement at, at ESCOM and the way in which um, the, the grid is holding up, and I think people are very despondent about that. Um, but, but what's your assessment of the state of ESCOM and the way in which it is managing um, the, the great difficulty, of course, of a, a very aged and uh, failing power system? Yeah. No, look, I've, I've got utmost respect for the management team um, and what, they, what they're trying to do. You know, I was at Eskom nine years ago, so I can't really comment on what they're doing. You know, I sit here like any South African. But, uh, you know, wish them all, all the goodwill. That's what we need to do. We need to get behind them, get behind the management and, and, and help out wherever we can. My thanks to Paulo Flati this evening, the head of uh, EY's Parthenon, the strategy consulting arm of EY, used to be called Ernst & Young. Paul O'Flati, once inside the belly of the ESCOM beast as finance director, that was a long time ago. What did he say? 15 years ago? 12 years ago? Long time ago. Paul O'Flati, his perspective on the big announcement from COP. Uh, 26 today um, that what we are seeing is a really good move in terms of this uh, quest for a just energy transition. The Money Show with Bruce Whitfield on 702. 702. In a moment, we will catch up with the chief executive of a business called Net One UEPS Technologies. Lots of controversy around the business a couple of years ago. Uh, but they're coming back in a big way with a 3.7 billion rand transaction. They're buying Connect Group. It's a South African fintech businesses that uh, business that focuses on emerging uh, markets, and they uh, serve the micro enterprise and informal sector. And they that business has grown substantially in recent years. So we'll chat to Chris Mayer, the chief executive of Net One UEPS Technologies, about that coming up in a couple of minutes' time. Fingers crossed.
On the next Money Show, Chief Executive at Discovery Bank, Hilton Kalner, is our shapeshifter. He's been given the job of disrupting the traditional banks. And well, anecdotally, it looks like he's having a, uh, a good go at them. We also do Discam's results and Colin Cullis with Business Unusual. Black Fridays, buy bots and who controls them, as well as consumer ninja Wendy Nola fighting for your consumer rights. Your vote can transform your city, community and future. Keep listening to 702 and Cape Talk to find out how. Well, with nearly 50% of the vote counted... Uh, We look at this with a great deal of interest, of course, as the power play is now going to be happening in earnest. I mean, lots of the Rathamist parties just are going absolutely nowhere. The ATM is going to be insignificant across many, many municipalities. The NFP as well, the UDM. Um, you know, you look at the UDM, for example, in Etiquini, and it's got less than half a percent of the vote. The AIC even less and the CCC whoever they are, forgotten actually who they are, but um, there is a, a fairly insignificant turnout uh, for the the much smaller parties. I'm not sure how the independents have done. We'll see my mind is independents, um, how they have held up today. I think it must be very, very difficult in many wards as an independent to get the traction that you need in order to make a massive impact, of course, on election outcomes. But yeah, at the moment in Etiquini, I mean, you look at the ANC below 50%, the DA at 23 and the EFF it's got enough in there but they could maybe the ANC IFP tie up that doesn't seem likely certainly not a Freedom Front Plus tie up couldn't see that happening either um, but yeah um, some some really interesting jockeying and jostling is going to be happening in the world of South African politics over the next couple of weeks as we try and figure out um, who is going to be a more comfortable bedfellow with whom and whether this is going to be done on a national basis, whether this can be done on a municipal basis. Um, because, uh, yeah, for the first time ever, South Africa's politics is increasingly divided. That's what it is. So, yeah, that's what we're picking up on this evening's Money Show. Andy Rice with Heroes and Zeros. That comes up after Eyewitness News at 7 o'clock this evening. We'll catch up with Chris Bishop, the founding editor at Billionaire Tomorrow. And then Investment Time Horizons. This is something Mduduzi Lutuli is going to talk about, the co-founder and executive director at Lutuli Capital. And he makes the point that, you know, people think it's really, really simple when you go into the world of investing. You say, you know, I'm just going to start now. And um, then I'll invest for two years. And then in two years, I will have enough money to do whatever I want to buy a new bicycle, buy a new car, whatever the case is. Uh, but really, Mduduzi Lutuli is concerned about how you behave and how you act during the time horizon of your investments. If you panic when the wind changes direction, if you panic in times of uncertainty, it can cost you an absolute fortune. Um, And that is what he is concerned about. So that education happening uh, this evening at half past seven on The Money Show, Mduduzi Lutuli, co-founder and executive director at Lutuli Capital. The Money Show. With Bruce Whitfield on 702. 702. I uh, see Haman Mashaba is uh, going into discussions with his team tonight as to who, with whom they should collaborate and cooperate because the ANC has failed to get 50% in many municipalities, so it's fallen below that critical threshold, and it's going to be looking for friends and allies, um, <laughs> or uneasy bedfellows, call it what you like. Um, they're going to be looking for somebody to team up with. And uh, Herman Mashaba on Twitter this evening just saying, uh, we have committed to engage residents on the coalition partners they would prefer us to consider. And he says, our Senate, the highest decision-making body of action for South Africa, is in a meeting tonight to discuss coalition details. And uh, the Action SA will isn't really that keen on going into coalitions with the DA and the ANC. So it's going to be interesting to see who they team up with. If you're not willing to do the DA or ANC, it does make your coalition much bigger and much more complicated than otherwise would be. Uh, but uh, Herman Mashaba is saying the ANC is the only party they have ruled out completely. They will not go into any coalition with the ANC. They will consider arrangements only that put the interests of the people ahead 
of politics and political parties. What an interesting turn up for the books this is as Herman Mashaba becomes a kingmaker potentially in various municipalities across the country with Action SA. Uh, a great and, and interesting breakthrough in South Africa's democracy. The ANC will be disappointed with its uh, turnout. The uh, EFF is going to be disappointed that it hasn't made bigger inroads. It has won some wards, but the DA also is going to be disappointed, I think, particularly in Nelson Mandela Bay. They won the Kucha municipality. That's around St. Francis Bay in that part of the world. Uh, but they haven't got the big prize in the Eastern Cape, which is still very much ANC supporting. And I think that has come through quite strongly today in all of the results updates that we have seen so far. The voting is going to go through the night. Um, the uh, vote is halfway through. So one can assume that now that the ballots are all in, that the rate of uh, counting is going to speed up. And then, of course, the votes are going to be verified see whether or not there are any sorts of objections to those particular votes. So critical night ahead for many municipalities in the country. And uh, as my colleague John Matham on Cape Talk earlier said, you know, he hopes that you get the result that you wanted and uh, you are sanguine about the result if it doesn't go the way that you had hoped. That, of course, is absolutely enormous in the life of South African voters who for many, and I mean, I've just, I, I really... I'm so pleased that voters in the Standerton municipality, and this is a big one, I mean, the municipality around Standerton is the Lekwa municipality. It failed dismally, and the, uh, we saw Astral Foods being forced to take it to court um, and to get the, the National Treasury to come in and put an administrator in just to get basic services running. <laughs> they were just completely incapable. Now, for the first time in, in Mpumalanga, the ANC has fallen below 50% in the Lekwa municipality around Standerton. They've seen their support go from 20 down to 13 seats, and the Lekwa Community Forum has got six. The DA has lost one. The FF gained one. Um, the Freedom Front Plus has picked up three, and ATM has picked up one. But certainly it's an historical day in many municipalities. And, of course, the municipality around Howick for the very first time becomes a victory zone for the Democratic Alliance. They're going to have a very young and energetic and enthusiastic mayor in that uh, in, in that municipality. Uh, and yeah, change is a good thing. It's wonderful to see change coming through in uh, the, uh, what is it, the Umgeni municipality in KZN. That is around what uh, you would, might know better as how it coming up after Eyewitness News, Andy Rice with Heroes and Zeros. That is coming up. We've uh, been let down by Chris Mayer at Net One. That's a pity. They announced a 3.7 billion rand deal for Connect Group. It's a South African fintech company. Maybe one day we'll catch up with him again. It's Eyewitness. Cape Talk to find out how. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. The Money Show proudly brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking, the bank that brings you the 2021 APSA Africa Financial Markets Index. That's Africanacity. APSA is a registered FSP. Welcome to The Money Show. Uh, Andy Rice with Heroes and Zeros. In a moment, Chris Bishop uh, with our Africa Business Report and Umduduzi Lutuli at Lutuli Capital with the Investment School. Uh, Trust in the advertising profession. Do you trust the advertising profession? It's not something I'd ever considered. I, I, I see often advertising as hyperbole. Um, often, I, I've not, it's not an industry that I would think about from a trust perspective. Do you trust accountants? They, I would think oh, you need to trust accountants. Doctors, definitely. Restaurateurs, definitely. They can kill you. Um, do you need to trust advertising people? I wonder. Andy Rice, in a moment. The Money Show. Ad feature. With Andy Rice. Trust in advertising. I mean, this isn't a trust industry, is it, Andy? It's a it's a sell, sell, sell industry. Surely trust shouldn't come in as a factor. It's about hyperbole, exaggeration, about opportunism and selling. A bit like financial journalism, really. Um, oh, Chris, hurtful, hurtful. <laughs> can I read something to you? Please. Um, which appeared in The Guardian, the English newspaper, um, quite recently, I believe, and it's being circulated around on, uh, on Twitter and other social media platforms. I'll just read you this very quickly. Stuff, stuff, stuff. Advertising people pushing at the open door of our acquisitive instincts dedicate their lives to fooling us into acquiring more of it. It bugs me how these people regard themselves as creatives 
as if they write plays or novels or grace lighted stages and silver screens. They think they make art. Oh, it's art all right, the very darkest of arts. How else to characterize what they create? Art that so brilliantly fools, lures fools like me into <laughs> buying stuff we don't need or even really want with money we often haven't got. More or less what you said shortly uh, a few minutes ago as an introduction, Bruce. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, when, when it comes to avatar, to trust, though, is it about public trust? Is it about client trust? Where does the trust equation fall? Well, I think brands are all about trust, Bruce. It's probably one of the most important words in the brand lexicon is trust, because the reason you you build a brand and, and are, are loyal to it is because you can trust it to deliver whatever it delivered last time or whatever it promises to deliver. And uh, brands that that that, that um, breach their their customers' trust will certainly um, have a, a short history ahead of them. But it's it's it is interesting. Now I'm I'm. Uh, there's a there's a piece of research recently conducted by I think it was by Gallup, um, uh, admittedly not in this country, but nevertheless I see no reason why it should be fundamentally different. And it asks the question: How would you rate the honesty and ethical standards of people in these different fields, very high down to very low? And of course, one of the fields is advertising practitioners, and that comes two from the bottom, only managing to beat caste, health people and politicians, whereas nurses, medical doctors, teachers, pharmacists, uh, even police officers, although they might not have quite such the same resonance here, um, are all way at the top while we languish at the bottom. I'm not quite sure how fair that is. I really don't, because the, the, the critic who says that um, we, we can't call the advertising profession an art I think I think that's a little bit um, misguided and a little bit blunt. I think that the um, it assumes that every book published, every painting finished, every piece of music composed uh, is great, and that every advertisement is 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 ghastly and pernicious, to say the least. I don't think it's pernicious at the moment. I think it's just bad. Uh, yeah. We're going through a real slump in terms of advertising quality. But bad advertising should please those critics because they will be less persuasive and less likely to lure fools like him into the advertising trap. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I, I just, I, I love advertising. I love great advertising. I, I even sometimes love bad advertising, but only once, uh, and it just becomes annoying. Now, your hero this week, Andy, what would you make as a hero? Well, the financial services category um, uh, oh, sorry, that's going to be the zero. My apologies. Let me start again. The, um, the hero will be a British skill, uh, South African skills uh, on, on display at one of the biggest uh, global events uh, yet, which, of course, is COP in Glasgow. And uh, it's quite interesting to me how um, the, those big brands that have made their reputations distributing content, movies, documentaries, etc. Brands like Netflix and, and Showmax and Amazon have now moved into the commissioning of and distribution of uh, content. And uh, joining that list quite recently is YouTube, who have set up a channel called YouTube Originals, which, um, as the name implies, is a, um, uh, a set of documentaries and other material which uh, they have commissioned to be original uh, uh, ownership by by YouTube. And, and they've made uh, a series, they commissioned a series called Seat at the Table to be shown at the COP gathering starting yesterday, whenever it was. Um, and uh, it's, it's subdivided into about a dozen chapters. And one of them, one of the global directors invited to contribute comes from South Africa. Uh, it's, it's from a company called Let It Rain Films, um, and his name is Lee Doig, and uh, he was invited by activist Jack Harris, who will be presenting all these films at COP to make one of the one of the twelve. Um, and I think that's a real uh, kudos to South African production capabilities, creatively and technically, to to be selected. To, to show their film at such an enormously important gathering. Their film will, in fact, be available on the YouTube Originals channel um, tomorrow, I think, the 3rd of November. Okay. So we can see what all the, all, all the fuss is about um, from tomorrow on YouTube Originals. But hats off to Lee Doig to Let It Rain Films 
uh, for, for this achievement on behalf of the South African production industry. Wonderful. Good to have some good news for the production industry. It's been through the mill. It really has. You're zero. Financial services. You are Financial picking services. a fight with a zebra. Yes, I am. Um, and I think it's it's their fault. I'll be blunt. Um, the financial services category has produced some really great advertising over over the years, and and um, in the, in the category generally, and so has a, a one particular brand, Investec. I think they've they they were the mavericks when they opened shop, and they they stayed that way largely. Then they have a payoff line out of the ordinary, and there's a story that goes around about how the zebra became their icon, and it was because one of the um, the marketing team, when they had opened up in London, was driving, I think, to Oxford or somewhere, and in a field alongside the highway stood a lone zebra, which stood stood out like the proverbial um, in the English pastoral <laughs> countryside to see a zebra there. And that was uh, taken to be the emblem of doing things differently that Investec wanted to, to have. Now, they've just launched a new television campaign based around family wealth, um, and it is generic i'm afraid it is it is um, tedious uh it, it could be any brand and i think that um uh, a campaign that ends up uh, with such bland statements as your family your legacy let's talk it uses trees as a metaphor for uh, for generational growth in, in the family and uh i just think it has betrayed the creativity and the and the fabulous track record that Investec as a brand has in communicating that brand. So I'm afraid largely because they set the bar so high themselves for Investec, it is a zero this week. Um, and it's such a great pity because the financial services industry is an industry we have depended on for, you know, for, for beautiful advertising. I mean, we've seen so many campaigns do really well and you don't have to have liked them all, but, you know, Alan Gray has got provocative and thoughtful advertising. Coronation has done well on that. Citadel, even recently, I think, um, a bit like Woolies, they used the same guy, Pharrell Williams, um, to talk about freedom. Um, and, I mean, these guys do have enormous budgets for their advertising, so there really isn't an excuse, is there? I don't think so, and I think that Citadel um, example is a good one, Bruce, because they were uh, the, the, the Citadel ad and the uh, Investec ad, it seems to me, have, have uh, appeared on our screens at more or less the same time. And the Citadel one doesn't have such a, a great big idea, um, other than the concept of wealth gives you freedom. But I just love the music, and that alone is good enough for me. It's a, we've said this before, but if you get the music right to support the, the narrative and the, and and the communications, then uh, then you, you you increase the communicative strength of your advertising quite dramatically. And and the song "Freedom" by Pharrell Williams is the basis of that Citadel ad. And it's brave. He must have cost a fortune. Must have been an expensive <laughs> decision to take. But um, yeah, uh, good comparison, Bruce, between Citadel and uh, and, and Investec. Thank you, Andy Rice. Andy Rice with Heroes and Zeros. Unfortunately, Investec's new TV campaign, Andy doesn't like it, but Let It Rain Films on the new YouTube channel uh, getting a big hero thumbs up for their local production, which is going to be featured at COP26. Uh, and then uh, also just talking about a lack of trust in the advertising profession. I mean, the advertising profession is designed to part you from your money, um, like political parties, I suppose. And so as a result of that, you may be feeling a little less predisposed to the advertising profession uh, than many others. But thank you, Andy Rice with Heroes and Zeros. The Money Show. The Africa Business Report. The Africa Business Focus brought to you by the Intra-Africa Trade Fair where entrepreneurs, investors and governments from 55 African countries all meet to explore trade, business and investment opportunities. And welcome to The Money Show this evening, uh, Chris Bishop, who is the founding editor at Billionaire Tomorrow. Now, you know a youngster. Well, he's not that young anymore, perhaps, but when he was a youngster, he was a very confident his name is samuel dima what how do you pronounce his name samuel dimairo is his name dimairo um, funny enough actually billionaire tomorrow is one year old this week um he's Happy only birthday. slightly older this young man he's about <laughs> 30 years of age and um he is um 
Incredible young fella. He's got incredible confidence. He used to start going along to um, brokers' offices at the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange when he was 16 in his school uniform and said to the guys, listen, I'll help you out. I'll work for free if you teach me some of the ropes. And they were quite sort of taken aback and mystified by this guy, but they, they let him work there. And then he started uh, with $100 from his mum, started buying shares in the stock exchange. And even then he started taking money from his uh, school friends and uh, they they started to trade. He said he had one rule, which will maybe don't make anybody who's ever been at school smile. He said, if I make money, I'll give it to you. But if I lose your money, don't come chase me for it because you're not going to get it back. So hard luck. And this built up and he, he was fascinated by it. So one day, still in his school uniform, Samuel Di Mairo, he went to um, see the CEO of the stock exchange. They were thinking at the time it was still a, a sort of hand and paper exchange. There was nothing electronic there. And he said, look, I want to turn your uh, uh, $8 billion stock exchange electronic. So um, the guy was obviously, again, taken aback. And he said, well, OK, there's going to be a tender sometime. Keep your eye out. So the guy wasn't, um, uh, wasn't deterred. He went away. He put a board together. He got investors. And when the time came, they tendered for it and they got it. I mean, the guy was only in his 20, uh, I think he was about 26, 27 then. And he was leading, obviously, he got some high powered people on the board, um, lawyers and, and uh, business types and what have you. But um, incredible. And they apparently did something like $400 million worth of trades in the first couple of years on, uh, as he turns Zimbabwe's stock exchange to be electronic. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? And uh, I mean, he, by all accounts, he seems to have done a decent job. Is he a billionaire yet or is he simply on his way? Do you see great well, things for this young man? I think he's um, I think he's uh, very um, I think he's very well off. I don't know whether he's he's anywhere anywhere near that figure yet. I mean, he's driving, certainly one of his uh, well, one of his few vices, I can say, is driving fast cars. He's got a couple of AMGs that uh, he drives around uh, Har- Harare at a rate of knots. But he's, he's a guy, he's investing in all kinds of things now with the money that he uh, came through the uh, stock exchange deal. He's investing in uh, manufacturing, he's investing in agriculture. I mean, he's saying at the moment in Zimbabwe, I mean, the economy still may be struggling, but he believes the economy is getting out of the woods in Zimbabwe. And he's saying that uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities uh, for growing crops and uh, investing in agriculture right now. And, and that's where he's putting his money. So he's certainly no slouch. And uh, certainly he's uh, quite a, uh, a fascinating young man, I can tell you. Absolutely wonderful. And then another, you like the youngsters, a, a young guy from Ghana. Um, you bumped into him at the Global Business Forum Africa. And uh, Sangu Dele, what's Sangu Dele do? Well, Sangudele, I mean, he's a remarkable character. And as I say, I defy anybody who meets him not to laugh in the first five minutes. He's a very young, witty guy. I mean, he's like your your mate's younger brother. I mean, you if you walk past him on the streets of Accra, you wouldn't blink twice. I mean, he's just a young fellow. I mean, he comes from quite a sort of um, good family in uh, Ghana. But uh, basically, he seems to have cracked this investment thing. He's got something called Golden Palm Investments. Uh, and... He was the man who lent um, Flutterwave, the the famous fintech operation in West Africa that's making a fortune now. It's a unicorn. It's got more than a billion in assets. He lent it its it's first um, $300,000. He lent it to a guy called Ian Abuyeji, who I was talking about the other day, a Nigerian, another 30-year-old Nigerian guy who's pouring money into um, investments in fintech in West Africa. Now, he put it in. And uh, he, he wired this guy $300,000 before Abu Yeje had even uh, registered a company. And uh, <laughs> he said, oh, it's all right. I trust you. I know you'll come up with something. And sure enough, Flutterway became a $1 billion um, unicorn. And, and I said to him at the time, I said, well, what was it worth then? He said, well, when I put the 300000 it was capitalized at about $2.5 million. He said, now it's worth more than a billion. He said, well, do the maths how much I got back on that investment. But he's a remarkable guy and very humble beginnings in the business. I mean, it all started off with a, a, a kebab in Accra. He was eating this kebab and he thought, well, hang on, these kebabs are twice the price of anywhere, of anywhere else in Western Africa, including neighboring Burkina Faso. So he started to sort of research why. So then he, he went to the, 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 the people who made the stuff, then he went to the butchers, 
and then from the butchers, he went to the wholesalers, then to the suppliers, and eventually he found out what the problem was, that cows in Burkina Faso were half the price of what they were in Ghana. So he thought, okay, oh. there you are, there's there's a business for me. So um, he, get, he, he hired a truck, drove up to Burkina Faso, <laughs> got a bunch of cows in and imported them back to uh, to Ghana, where he sold them at a handsome profit. That's how he made his first money. He's going to be in Paris. I'm going to speak to him later this week at lunchtime. Sadly, I, w- I won't be in Paris with him, but I'll be speaking ah. to him. And he's a remarkable guy. I mean, he, he's like a young guy, and he's now lending to other young guys in Africa who are coming up and uh, creating these, these tremendous um, companies. Brilliant. And then somebody we know better than these two is Muhammad Duji. Now, he uh, is he Dowji or Duji? Um, Muhammad Dowji, I think it is. Duji. Um, and Duji, uh, he yeah. is one of Africa's youngest billionaires. Um, and you, you've uh, also caught up with him fairly recently. Yes, I mean, again, he was in Dubai, and I always like always liked him. I mean, I mean, he's probably getting on a bit now. Maybe he's forty four, forty five, but certainly he's a man who's turned his uh, his family business called Metal. He's turned it from a import export operation into this incredible manufacturing beer muff. I mean, they do everything from sizal um, production. They do also um, fizzy drinks. They do um, also all kinds of commodities and uh, manufacture. That's how he made his money. But one of his, um, one of his, uh, can we say, vices, and um, say that uh, Samuel Di Mairo's vice was fast cars, one of his vices is football. I mean, when he was a child, because um, his family, they, they, they weren't always rich. I mean, it was his father really who built up the business, but his, his grandparents, they, they started out from scratch with a little trading business selling rice and sugar in a tiny little hut in the middle of Tanzania. But when he was a boy, they didn't have much money. And he used to support a team called Simba in Tanzania. And he was so poor at the time, he had to climb over the fence. He couldn't afford the entrance money. But now he's made his cash with these tremendous uh, investments that he's made. He's um, basically, what he's done, he's decided to um, invest in them, uh, Simba. I mean, he's put loads of money into the club. They're now going up the ranks in Africa as one of the leading uh, clubs on the continent. It was always his dream. He put money into them, and um, he, he's you know proper training pitches. They've made big signings. They're a lot more professional outfit. But uh, he told me when he was in Dubai that yeah, it was a great ride. But he was saying you put money into a football club, and you don't very often take it out. So he's put in his uh, his money into Simba in uh, Tanzania. And again, I'll hear a big um, cry of ouch from a lot of people out there, especially people who don't like football. Is uh, He gave me the idea that he put in like $10 million into the football club sure. and basically said goodbye to it. I mean, <laughs> talk hey, about philanthropy. Passion. I mean, I know passion. very much into passion. philanthropy. Yeah? Passion. That's what it is, Chris. That's what it is. Yeah, it uh, is it's, passion. It's, it is, absolutely. And hey, when you're rich enough, it's petty cash, and you're doing a good thing, and you're living the dream. But yes, ouch, it's a bit like a wine farm, I'm told. Thank you very much, Chris Bishop. He is the founding editor of Billionaire Tomorrow. Three great stories from around the African continent of promising young, and some people who were young when they we, we first heard of them, Mohamed Duji being one of them, but uh, exceptional stories of great success across the African continent. Join Africa's largest trade and investment fair in South Africa, Intra-Africa Trade fair gives you access to more than a thousand exhibitors, 10,000 visitors and buyers, 5,000 conference delegates and more than 55 countries. Participate in trade and investment deals worth 40 billion US dollars as businesses and government come together to explore business and networking opportunities at the International Exhibition. Brought to you by the African Export Import Bank and their premium partners, the Intra-Africa Trade Fair 2021, transforming Africa. After Eyewitness News, we've got Nduduzi Lutuli to keep us company. He's going to be joining us in our investment school. Also in Eyewitness News in a moment, the latest on the elections, local government elections, low turnout local government elections 2021. 702. Bruce is on Twitter at Bruce Business.
It's so interesting to see, and Finn, and uh, News Twenty Four does some very good projections um, on their website. Um, Davy Scoltz does it for them. He is a he's very good at this sort of stuff, and he's been remarkably successful in recent elections in terms of the accuracy of his forecasts. And he's uh, done a Johannesburg projection for News Twenty Four. And if you look at the numbers themselves, they are fairly, you know, the DA has lost a lot of ground, the ANC has lost a lot of ground, the FF is flat, Action SA, of course, has gained a huge amount because it's brand new. Um, but if you combined the votes of, say, the ANC and the EFF, you get to 45% of the votes in uh, Gauteng. Still not enough to have a coalition. You'd need to get lots of smaller parties in. If the DA and Action SA teamed up, you'd get to 45%, which means they would need to negotiate with the smaller parties to try and create a coalition. We headed into a very messy period of coalition. Um, and they certainly, it looks like it's going to happen also in Nelson Mandela Bay in a very serious way. Um, other coalitions may be a bit simpler when you've got uh, parties that might not have a majority, but they've got a, a higher level of support than having to get more than two parties together to try and work together um, to try try and govern a, a particular um, municipality. We saw it all fall apart horribly uh, for political, for, for residents of uh, Tswane. We saw it fall apart horribly for residents of the city of Johannesburg. And we saw it fall horribly apart for Nelson Mandela Bay with all the political infighting and nonsense that accompanied um, the, the grab uh, for power in, in those particular municipalities. Coalitions should work better. There should be a checks and balances. But unfortunately, our experience of coalitions so far, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, certainly have not been spectacular in South Africa in recent times. The Money Show is proudly brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking. The bank that brings you the 2021 APSA Africa Financial Markets Index. That's Africanacity. APSA is a registered FSP. The Money Show. Investment School. When it comes to investing, do you ever think about the time horizon of your investments? Your pension money, maybe you resign yourself to the fact that your pension money is not going to be accessible to you before the age of you know, 55 in an RA. You can start accessing some of uh, some of that money. The age of 60, perhaps, maybe the age of 65. You, maybe you you've, you've understand the concept of time horizon there. But what about other kinds of investments? What about if you're investing into exchange-traded funds or you're investing into unit trusts or directly into shares themselves. What are your time horizons? What's your investment horizon? Umduduzi Lutuli is co-founder and executive director at Lutuli Capital. What exactly are we talking about when we're talking about an investment horizon? Yes, good evening, Bruce, and uh, good evening to the listeners. You know, I, I thought about this topic because I was recently talking to a friend and they're asking me my opinion on the SA market asking me if it's still capable of providing above inflation returns over the long term and if it's worth taking the risk. And I simply hate these type of questions because I never know what people expect me to say, you know, when they say, what do you, what do you think of the market? Because any answer I give has a 100% chance of being wrong or right. And no matter the justification I give for my answer, there, there are countless variables beyond my influence and, and universe of knowledge that could make a correct that could render a correct answer wrong. And I'm, I'm deeply reticent to talk about these type of in, investment related issues outside of work because primarily, primarily because it usually ends up with a person wondering if I really have a job in the investment industry because I, I don't know where markets are heading. I don't have any good stock tips. I have no unequivocal opinions on key economic issues because doing so just for me, just uh, it is proof shows proof of ignorance of how markets work because any investment forecast anyone gives you, I strongly believe is purely entertainment. That's my belief that it's it's something we do in the investment industry to give the impression that we have some sort of semblance and control in financial markets when we simply don't. That's that's the truth. And unfortunately, people ask me this, and I give them that boring answer. I don't know. It's a, it's inevitably a conversation killer when people ask me my opinion. And I say, and I say I have none. What I instead try and do is to turn the conversation to sensible, broad investment principles. And on this occasion, I said something along the lines of, 
Well, it depends on your time horizon. If you're investing for the long term, like for your retirement, your pension, then then yeah, probably buying undervalued assets can be a good thing, you know, going into the market and holding for the long time, dependent on your investment strategy. But if you're looking for a short term trade, the risk and uncertainty is extremely high. And whilst I think the general point here is sound, on reflection, I actually made a major behavioral omission, uh, which I think is fairly co- is fairly common when you think about time horizons. When we talk about investment time horizons, we often focus on only two discrete points, the beginning and the end. When, when are we investing and when we plan to disinvest? And if I make an investment in my pension today, which I hope to draw upon in 30 years time, then my time horizon is clear. It's 30 years, right? Yeah. But while this is an incredibly yeah. important element of any investment decision, our tendency is to focus on the start and the end and neglect what we might do in the intervening period because <laughs> nobody opens an account and they never looks at it for 30 years. And our behavior within our clearly defined time period, this 30 years or 10, or 10 years or whatever it is, is the greatest, our behavior between that period is the greatest determinant of our investment success, but not enough emphasis is placed on that as opposed to your market forecasts and analysis. And and that's why I wanted to discuss this topic this evening, because when people say my time horizon is 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, whatever it is, I always say to people, well, yes and no, because it's also depending on what you do between that, because your your investment time period is not 30 years if you are constantly interacting with your portfolio on a daily basis. Your time horizon is not 30 years, it's 24 hours. And properly defining time, time horizon and how that defines risk and influences our behavior is, is extremely important, and that's why I wanted to, to talk about that this evening. Yeah. Is it is it naive for me to suggest that the best thing that most people could do with their money is to pick a good general equity unit trust, to set a um, a a direct debit on their bank account and put it at inflation plus mm. say five percent a year, uh, to increase mm. um, uh, and and to simply do that and to never look at their investment statement and only at the end of 30 years to see what had accumulated over that time because you're keeping up your contributions with inflation you're seeing booms and busts happen but you have the good sense to ignore the noise whether it be the market halving or the market doubling in a short period of time whatever it might be you just keep on adding surely that is the best investment strategy in the world for sure, but uh, unfortunately, people never want <laughs> simple solutions. They never yeah. want simple solutions. I say to clients, I'm like, listen, if you don't want to pay me my fee and you don't want an investment advisor and you just spend your time understanding asset allocation, like what is your risk profile and how much money you should have in equities or property, you know, in different assets according to your risk profile, number one. Number two, understand the impact of fees. And then number three, like, do as little as possible. And that's the hardest thing for people to do because just getting your asset allocation right and getting your costing right, that's like 80% of 80% of the determinant of your of your investment success, you know? But the problem is people don't want simple simple solutions when it comes to investment markets. What I probably should have said in response to my friend when they then when they asked me the question of SA markets is that. You know, it depends on your time horizon, yes. And even if you have a long-term objective, are you going to be checking the portfolio valuation and pouring over the news every day? What will be your behavior during your time horizon? Because if you'll be interacting with your portfolio daily, then your time horizon might be a great deal shorter than you think. Like I said, it's not 30 years, it's 24 hours. But what I mean by this is that even if our circumstances do not change, our behavior can lead to our realized time horizon for any given investment being materially different to what we have stated at the outset. So let me put that in more plain English. The overwhelming driver of of our returns is how we engage with financial markets. So you can have a good portfolio, you can have your asset allocation right, you can have the costing correct, 
But what could truly mess you up is how you actually engage with financial markets. How frequently are we checking our portfolio? How easily can we trade and make decisions? How anxious do daily price fluctuations make us? Are we always watching the news and feeling a need to react to that? Are we checking on short-term performance? Because making or investing in a long-term in investment or saying that you're a long-term investor is not simply investing money with the aim of, of meeting a, a temporary distant goal, but understanding the behavioral discipline required to be a long-term investor. Uh, and, and the easiest route is simply to disengage, like you, like you said, is to disengage from the daily cacophony of markets and economic news and commit to a long-term investment plan, but like easier said than done. And for many people, unfortunately, that is not feasible. Because Why is it have, so flippin' hard to do? I'll tell you what, because investors love stories. We love creating a narrative about markets because it, 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 we struggle with the concept of understanding that we have so little control over this dynamic market. So what we're constantly doing is creating narratives and stories which fool us into thinking that, oh, X happened, therefore Y was the result. And if Y happens, this will happen. You know, we love narratives and, and thus, and thus we, we stuck in a constant battle between our long-term objectives and our short-term behavioral pressures. And unfortunately, in that battle, there's typically one winner. We get swept up by the narrative and the need to engage with that narrative. And this leads us to constantly be fiddling with our portfolio. Oh, I'm in this fund, but now I just heard that that fund was the top performer. Oh, I was investing in the U.S. markets, but I just heard that the, the Asian markets are doing all. Oh, maybe I should go there. So we're constantly <laughs> fiddling with our portfolios and okay. we're responding to these daily fluctuations. And the reality is that financial markets are they provide an unrelenting torrent of outcomes uh, which we seek to forecast or explain via stories and indeed this is much of what most of the industry does and then what one, what one might think that the notion of storytelling seems harmless but for investors what it does is it leads to over trading overconfidence stress partiality and thus the simplest and most effective thing to do which is Define your asset allocation, keep costs low, have an investment strategy, and leave the portfolio alone. The simplest thing to do becomes the hardest thing to do because we just we love interacting with markets. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's all about the stories. Let's make it about mm-hmm. rules in a moment with Mduduzi Lutuli at Lutuli Capital. Four rules for avoiding market noise and ensuring you do stay the course. You do that thing that I suggested. The Warren Buffett approach. Buy forever. That's the, that's the time horizon. How to do that in a moment. The Money Show is proudly brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking. The bank that brings you the 2021 APSA Africa Financial Markets Index. That's Africanacity. APSA is a registered FSP. The Money Show. Investment School. So what are the rules for avoiding market noise and ensuring you stay the course? Mduduzi Lutuli, co-founder at Lutuli Capital. What are those rules? Yes, so so I've got a few rules for that. The first, uh, I always say to to clients uh, if they believe that they can make forecasts, as I say exactly that. So at the beginning of each year, make a set of market or economic predictions for the year ahead. Because most of us are aware that uh, of our general incompetence at making forecasts and predictions, but most of us engage in it anyway. So to really disabuse yourself of any notion of of prescience and having an ability to forecast, I say to clients, simply write down some market forecasts for the year ahead and then review them in 12 months time. And this will provide a very cold dose of reality that any forecast you make is purely for entertainment. Nobody knows what the future will hold. This task should be carried out each year for at least five years so that you don't get carried away in case you just get one lucky year, because that is possible to get one lucky round and think all of a sudden you have some sort of forecasting power. So actually make forecasts and then you'll realize how bad you are at making forecasts. My second rule is just simply just check your portfolio less frequently. If you really want to make informed decisions, you want to have a lot of data. So you don't, you can't make a meaningful decision if you're checking your portfolio every day. The best defense against 
most of our debilitating behavioral biases is simply to engage with financial markets less regularly. The more we review short-term performance and pour over every fluctuation in the value of our portfolios, the more likely it is that we'll make poor short-term decisions. And the common wisdom that being uh, that that somehow looking at your portfolio will give you some sort of advantage is is simply erroneous and it's a damaging belief in, in investments. Another thing you can do, which really has helped me, is read something or find or follow someone that you disagree with extremely <laughs> when it comes to investments. Find someone who has the exact opposite view that you have when it comes to investments. This is a brilliant, brilliant tool for fighting confirmation bias because confirmation bias is incredibly damaging for investors and, it influ- and its influence appears to be exacerbated by the rise of social media. So we follow the people who we tend to agree with, who share our principles, we read their articles because we agree with them, uh, and then we find ourselves locked into this little bubble because it makes us feel good. But the problem is that there are things that we currently believe that are wrong, and we don't realize that they are wrong because we live in an echo chamber, because we follow and read people who are always agreeing with us. So find someone who absolutely makes you angry when it comes to investments and who totally disagrees with you. That's fantastic for, for confirmation bias. Con- confirmation last- bias is so interesting. Sorry, before before you carry on, confirmation bias is so interesting. Adrian Gore uh, would give statistics at, uh, at presentations and stuff and talk about confirmation bias. And I think one of the questions they asked was, are you an above average driver? And something like 80% or 90% of people said, yes, I am. <laughs> and 90% yeah. of people can't yeah. be above yeah. average. I mean, it's just yeah. that sense yeah. of self-belief, isn't it? It can't be true. It's, you just drive around Joburg and you'll know that <laughs> that's a lie. You no, know. you know, you, um, you, I, I'm certainly better than most of Joburg drivers. I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> that's a fact. <laughs> that's that's not an opinion. One percentile. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the last rule uh, as we wrap up for me is just you got to get comfortable doing nothing. And this is probably the hardest thing for investors, particularly for professional investors. We have this constant pressure to act and to prove that we're doing something. And the, and the pressure to act is very overwhelming because financial markets are in a perpetual state of flux and uncertainty, and our clients want us to constantly be reacting to that. And investors are expected to constantly react. Something has changed. What are you doing about it? Doing nothing can seem very lazy or negligent or incompetent, when in the majority of cases, it's, it's, it's actually the best course of action. So find principles and stick to them. And stop interrupting the compounding effect. Enjoy the long-term benefits of, of, of compounding. It sounds easy, but the behavior reality of investing means that it's actually very difficult to do because doing nothing actually requires a great deal of effort. And I mean, you could look at 9-11, you can look at the global financial crisis, you can look at the short, sharp shock that markets saw in um, with COVID-19 in April last year. Had you done nothing mm. in each one of those massive politically and socially disruptive events, you would have felt mm. grotesque for the period where you mm. lost money, but you would have made it back mm. and then some and you would never and you would perform better than by trying to call markets and fiddle fiddle around on the margin? Most definitely. And I always say to any new client, I say, well, thank you for, for, for appointing me and, and uh, to manage your portfolio. But I'll only find out really if you believe what I'm saying, if you're drinking my Kool-Aid, when the crash comes. Because when the crash comes and I say to you, we don't need to do anything, relax. That's when I'll actually know if you have actual trust in me as an investment manager and in the investment strategy, because doing nothing, like I say, requires a great deal of effort. Thank you, Mduduzi Lutuli, this evening. He is the co-founder and executive director at Lutuli Capital. 702. Bruce is on Twitter, at Bruce Business. That's it from The Money Show for this evening. We'll know by this time tomorrow, I'm pretty sure, exactly what the lie of the land is when it comes to the coalitions, the alliances that have been formed in order to try and see how your area will be governed better than it has been into the future. Till next time, good night.